angry people shout at talk show host Dave Rubin. We are not the problem. We yeah. Do you have a question? Former colleagues smear him. He was lazy when he worked here. He's lazy now with his ridiculous show. That ridiculous show is the Rubin Report. Its popularity enraged these people largely because Rubin was a leftist who began criticizing the left. Also, they hated that he interviewed some libertarians and conservatives. I talked with Rubin for half an hour after his show became a success. I released five minutes of that interview in 2018. But now I've learned that many of you like longer interviews, so here's my full interview with Dave Rubin. I'm puzzled by the anger on the left about everything. There is anger about everything because they believe they're victims. And when you're a victim, you have the righteous indignation to be angry at everything and at everyone. So I get a particular uh, special strain of this anger because I was one of them. And when they see uh, a refugee leave and escape and then, and then get to some level of success, that's, that's the kryptonite for them, right? Because they don't want people to realize, oh, you can get out of this, that you can find what your truth is, you can find a, another path, you can find success, you can, can find happiness, whatever, whatever it is you're looking for, you can find it. And they don't want that because they want conformity. You helped create a whole new medium, these podcasts. I just felt if there were more people having honest conversation, that we wouldn't be in the mess we were in. And that, this is when I, this is three, four years ago, actually. And it seems to me the mess has only gotten worse, but there is a glimmer of hope here, which is that because of long form conversations happening on podcasts and on YouTube, and it's not just me, by the way, there's Joe Rogan and there's others, we're allowing people to go, all right, let's really listen to something. Let's really unpack an idea. Let's really have two people who disagree uh, sit down and talk about things. Let's really look someone in the eye and figure out what's going on here. And let's not do what CNN and Fox and MSNBC are doing all the time, which is just putting on talking heads to spout uh, talking points. I the am going to That's all they're doing. You don't learn anything when you watch CNN. In most cases, I guarantee you, you will, you will actually be dumber but having watched CNN. Because because you're on your own you issues. Issues. That really is the truth because it's not designed to give you information that you can do anything with. It's designed to keep you watching. There's a reason, you asked me right before we start, uh, how often we're doing shows now. And we do one or two a week and I don't think we should do more. And it's not because I don't wanna work more. Believe me, I'm busting my ass every day and I'm on the road and a, and a zillion other things. It's that I think there's a limit to how much people should be, pay, be paying attention to these things. I think if you give me an hour of your week and you give Stossel some time and you give Rogan some time and some other podcasts some time, well, you know what? Go live too, go, go work, go date, go do whatever you do, play some sports, whatever. I do five 10 minute videos. I, yeah. Who wants to listen to an hour? It was completely the reverse of what everyone was doing and I just felt it was the right thing. I don't know why exactly. Were you surprised? I can tell you the, the first day, so we launched on, originally as an interview show, we launched on Aura TV, which is Larry King's digital network. And I was doing a panel show. That's what I had been doing at the Young Turks, so these quick little clickbaity videos, but I did my first show with Sam Harris and we did this hour, hour and a half long interview. And I finished and I walked into the control room and I said to my guys, that's the best thing I've ever done. It felt real, it felt honest. We, we didn't do it for clicks, we did it for truth. And from that interview, I said, all right, this is what I'm gonna do. I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I started doing more of these long form interviews and people kept watching and then suddenly I realized, whoa, there's a lot of people that are thinking the things that I'm thinking. There's a lot of people that are going, something's wrong with the left. And I, at the time I was saying it as a lefty. Now I'm very comfortable here with you crazy libertarians. But at the time, that's wh where I was. And we, we just, we did what was natural. That, that's really all that you we You watched the YouTube counts? Or how did you know people were? Yeah, I mean, the numbers started jumping, but it wasn't just that. It was traction that I could see on Twitter. But it was also, it was really more than anything else. It was actually old school emails that I was getting where people were writing me pages and pages of emails from all, literally all over the world. But the ones that affected me the most were these ones in the middle of the country. It would be somebody like a, saying, I'm a, you know, I'm a 54 year old um, Christian conservative and I've never heard a liberal talk about issues and not put me down. And I thought, 
well, now we must be on to something. And it was just by doing what I thought was right. I, I don't think I have all the answers, but I'm happy to talk to people and treat them with respect if they'll do the same for me. So that's really when I started realizing something bigger was happening. You're now criticized by the left as being too cozy with the right. I would say that generally speaking, the left-right paradigm or the, the left-right dichotomy, whatever you want to call that, it doesn't really fly anymore. I think you basically have libertarians, and I mean that in, that in terms of people who basically want to live and let live, and then you have authoritarians and people who want the government to control things. So I don't know where, where that really falls left-right anymore. Since I started down this political evolution, where I've now connected with people like you and, and conservatives like a Ben Shapiro or a Dennis Prager or, or Larry Elder or just any of these people, some of the Fox guys like Gutfeld or Tucker, Everybody, for all the differences that we might have, I'm pro-choice, most of them are pro-life. You know, I'm, I'm against the death penalty, most of them are for the death penalty. They're all willing to sit down and discuss ideas. And we all, I think, agree on one thing more than anything else, which is within the, the framework of free speech, which is that we wanna live in the same country. I wanna live in the same country with people who disagree with me. And the problem that the left is having right now is if you deviate from whatever the given moment of feelings are, they will expunge you because they say they're for gay people, they're for Muslim people, they're for women, except gay people don't all think the same thing. Muslim people don't all think the same thing. Women don't all think the same thing. They wish they did, but they don't. So you gotta boot everybody out. So what they're doing is they're creating the widest tent ever because I see a tent now where you've got some of the Trump people, you've got the libertarians, you've got some of the never Trumpers, you've got conservatives, you've got classical liberals who are all coming together and going, let's, let's talk about this stuff. And then you've got one group that's just basically become a monolith of groupthink. And I'm much happier to sit and disagree with somebody if we can do it honestly and, and with a, a little decency. My experience was when I went from left to libertarian was that the right was willing to argue. Yeah. Hannity would have me on his show to argue about something. The left just didn't want to talk to me. I was never on NPR. The fundamental reason for that is that the right or conservatives, libertarians, whatever it is, if you believe in the individual, then you fundamentally understand that individuals are different. So you are willing to sit down with someone different than you. Even though I know you and I agree on, on most stuff, if we did this for hours, we'd probably get to a place where we're about 80%, let's say, in agreement. But I know that whatever those disagreements might be, if, if we do this again next month or you come on my show in two months from now, we could, we could have the argument. And guess what, Stossel, maybe I'd move you a little bit on something and you might move me. That's a beautiful thing and I see that right now. I see real fertile ground with the group that is always called the intolerant group, the conservatives. I see some tolerance there and I just don't see it on the other place. But please guys, if you're watching this and you're a lefty and a progressive watching Stossel, please prove me wrong. The video of you being hassled as a speech. We are not the problem. We yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I got you. You're at the University of New Hampshire, and how do you handle that? Because you don't want to let them silence you, but they'll keep chanting. Oh yeah, they'll keep chanting. First off, often at these events, the people that are there to protest, they're not there to listen, they're there to protest. So they have noisemakers. They're very industrious, John. They want to catch you in, in one slight misstep of a word. They're screaming at you. You know, there was a moment in this video, which by the way, just for the record, I did not want this two hour video to be posted uh, because I did it and I knew it was, it was crazy and these kids were screaming at me and I didn't want to make it about, I didn't want these kids to have to be in public embarrassing themselves. Don't you want to embarrass them for their intolerance? I guess at some level, yes, but I, I think there's still a piece of me that just wishes we could all be a little bit better. So I did not not want to post the video, but then a couple of people got a hold of the video and selectively edited it to make it seem as if I was silencing people and the rest of it. So then I was like, you know what, we're going to put it up unedited and let it be. Now in retrospect, I'm glad we did and it has millions of views and all that. But there were people there, they don't come to listen, and they, they then use their free speech to shut down your free speech as at the same time they're telling you how horrible free speech is. The best example of this is there was a woman in the back who is trans who kept yelling at me for a series of different things. I said to her, I want you to live with, this, uh, with the same rules, the same laws, the same decency, the same respect that every other person in this nation deserves and has a right to. I said, I hope you have somebody that, that you love and find happiness, all of these things. I said, the one thing is 
that I don't want the government to be able to tell me what pronouns to use when I'm referring to you. I said, I'll use the right ones. You just can't give that sort of power to the government. Sometimes people are gonna be mean. The government can't fix that. Uh, she continued to yell at me and, and, and curse at me and stuff. I didn't know this till months later. It turned out the woman is a gender studies professor at the university. So a gender studies professor at a university is vocally shouting down a speaker. She was live tweeting it, calling me alt-right and the rest of it. And this is tolerated at universities today. And how did that one resolve? Did, did she eventually shut up and you got to speak? Well, I just kept going. You can't go over the Black Lives Matter chants. They drown you out. Well, usually they get tired. These people get tired pretty quick. No, but you know what? They stick to a script. And if you notice, one of the things that I did, I, I made a point of saying to them when some of the kids were uh, kids, students, whatever they are, when they, were, when they were right in front of me, you know, just as close as we are, I would say, you know what? They're chanting. I'd say, could you look me in the eye and ask me a question? I'm here. Ask me a question. Make a point. I'll, I'll gladly respond. And they can't and they immediately look away because they can't, they're programmed. And if you can break that programming, then you can get somewhere good. Hate speech does incite violence. Hate speech does incite violence. They chant this because you, they say, honor right-wing violent people. Well, I certainly don't honor right-wing violent people. I will sit down with most people. There are certain people I wouldn't sit down with for sure. But they categorize anyone who disagrees with them as a violent right-wing person. They think I'm a right-wing extremist. And this is the problem. There isn't, they call everyone a Nazi and then they keep expanding the definition of what a Nazi is. And then at the same time, they'll tell you it's okay to punch a Nazi. Well, if you can punch a Nazi, can you, can you blow up his car? Can you attack his house? What about his kids? Should they be allowed to go to school? And also these people are not Nazis. Nazis were in World War II Germany. These people are something else and it's, it, by and large, not to say that there aren't racists, of course there are racists in this country, and of course there are bigots, and there are bigots on the left and bigots on the right, but they've created this boogeyman because it allows them not have to, have to deal with real issues more than anything else. You said the alt-right as fun, call out the bull, mock the power, that's amazing. You know where the funny stuff is coming? From the alt-right. First off, I said this about two years ago, I think, and what I was talking about, this is at the beginning of when people were using the phrase alt-right, and there was a different version of the alt-right than it's come to be. Now it's come to be this, this bigoted, racist, it's the term itself. You wouldn't say this now? Well, no, I would say that as a, meaning that there were these meme makers that do all these funny, silly, often offensive things, using Nazi imagery and this frog imagery. The, the Pepe the Frog that you might know of was the ultimate example of this. These meme posters decided, could we start sending images of a crudely drawn frog to celebrities and that so that celebrities would think that it's somehow hate speech. And then somehow that all bubbled up to the point where Hillary Clinton is calling half the country deplorables. A basket of deplorables. There's an absolute connection there. So I said as a, uh, meaning the, the meme posters and those silly people who are just trolling all day long, are, yeah, are they exhausting and annoying? Sure, but do they do some fun stuff? Yes, but that's different than the genuinely racist people. So I will be very clear here, Stossel. I am 100% against anyone who uses uh, prejudice or bigotry or believes they have a right to anything because of their skin color or anything like that. The gold medal goes to the most offended. What do you mean? This is what the left has created. It's an oppression Olympics. It's a hierarchy of oppression. So you've got to figure out how you are oppressed. If you have a limp, you're this much oppressed. Or if you're a Jew, this much oppressed. Or a Muslim, this much oppressed. Or black, this much. Or whatever it is. Now, for whatever reason, they seem to put Islam at the top of that, uh, the set of ideas which is Islam, and then there's people that are Muslims, and you should never be bigoted towards people, but you are allowed to criticize ideas, and Islam is an idea, like Christianity is an idea, and Judaism is an idea, and a political party has a set, a platform, a set of ideas. You should criticize those just like you should criticize any other set of ideas. So what specifically woke me up was how they were dealing with Islam that they were taking an idea that is extremely totalitarian in nature, okay? And this, again, I just said it, but I wanna be very clear. You can talk about a set of ideas, in this case, Islam, without being bigoted towards Muslim people. I have Muslim friends, okay? Now, you can do that, but still criticize an idea. The left has, an, has a strange obsession with Islam because they believe it's a brown person's religion, which in itself is actually a racist thought because there are white Muslims and there are black Jews. Well, they're not powerful. In any case. They meaning? Muslim nations, 
by and large, white American Christians, whether they're white or not, have the power. The Muslim world doesn't have money, power. So that's, that's a geopolitical conversation that I'm happy to have with you. But basically what I saw was the way they were talking about this idea that was contrary to all of their other ideas. Islam has been terrible for women. It's been terrible for gays. It's been terrible for minorities. I mean, go anywhere in the Muslim world and the fact is all of the things that progressive purport to be for are horrible there. And yet they have this fascination with the set of ideas around it. And the reason for that is because they're both totalitarian in nature. I mean, that they both want you to bow to them. That really is the truth. What the left has created though is a system where everyone wants to be oppressed. So the best example I can give of this is that at the Women's March, Bernie Sanders was supposed to be the keynote speaker and they didn't want him to speak because he's a man. So Bernie, the standard bearer of the left, is no longer oppressed enough to speak there. Or when uh, at a gay pride rally in Toronto about a year and a half ago, uh, Black Lives Matter stopped the rally and made the organizers sign their, their list of orders basically because they said, we're more oppressed. We Black Lives Matter in Canada, which it's not even a Canadian issue, we are more oppressed than you gay people. So it's a constant battle. That's why this thing will destroy itself. It's a snake that eats its own tail. It's not, it's not something based in virtue, it's based in victimhood. But there's truth behind it. Blacks have been oppressed. Some still are. Women are sometimes oppressed. No society's perfect, but the United States, by and large, has given more freedom to more people from every walk of life, regardless of your skin color, your sexuality, your gender, your original nationality, et cetera, et cetera. So does that mean everything's perfect here? No, but everyone still wants to come here. Nobody's leaving the United States, not even the celebrities who always say they're gonna leave. They never leave. And why is that? Because it's still pretty damn good. So I would say this is where their word oppression isn't the right word. If you wanna say there are problems, we gotta fix those problems. If you tell me we have a problem with uh, prison reform, sure. Do we have a problem with the war on drugs? Sure. Do we have problems? Yes. Do we have a problem that we give too, give too many handouts, which then people keep people dependent on it, and that has disproportionately hurt the black community? And who's done that more? It's the Democrats, actually, but that's a whole other thing. Yes, we can talk about all of those things, but to tell me those are things because you are oppressed, it ain't true. That idea needs to be decimated. You and I both started on the left. Yeah. Why did you switch? Oh, I woke up. I, I mean, that's it. Once, once I started waking up, it crumbles very quickly. Well, what woke you up? It was building for a while, and there were a couple things that had happened between Charlie Hebdo, where I saw the left defending people who had murdered people over free speech, I mean, over the ability to use satire. There was a series of things like that. It just kept building and building and building. And also, I really, I think what it really came down to was, I realized that not everyone that these people disagreed with could be a racist and a bigot and a homophobe and a sexist. And that was the argument that was constantly being laid out. If there was a Republican that gave a speech and said, we should lower taxes, their answer was, he's racist. Now that actually makes no sense. Now what they would argue is, he wants to cut taxes, that means less money for the poor. The poor are generally minorities, that means he hates minorities, thus he is racist. Now, first off, you could do a zillion uh, arguments against that, including the fact that most of the policies of the Democrats, of big government policies, have locked people into being poor. I mean, there's a zillion ways we could go with that. But putting that aside, the simplicity of the argument started seemingly being insane to me, basically. Just because you're for low taxes, just because you're for states' rights, uh, just because you're for individual autonomy and school choice and all of these other things that are really about you getting some of the power back for yourself and keeping what's yours, which is what most people actually want, that does not mean you're racist. When you see through that, what happens is you start realizing this is thrown at us everywhere. And what I would say is you should try to steel man your opponent's argument rather than just label them with something. I mean, take their argument and go, what really is this? Not just take it to, oh, I disagree with them, so they're racist. But once I woke up to identity politics and the sort of laziness of the arguments of the left, what I quickly realized was, wait a minute, wait a minute, these guys are railing against government all day. They hate everyone in government. And yet their answer always is more government. Their answer is always more taxes, give more government more power. If the president could only do this much more, if Congress could only do this much more. And at the same time, you'll say to them, well, what does government do right? 
And they'll say basically nothing. They'll say, wait a minute, we're wasting all this money on wars. Well, okay, fine, I can be with you on a lot of that stuff. Then what do you wanna do? Starve them from their power. And how do you starve them from their power? Keep your money for yourself. I believe that you, John, can figure out what to do with your money better than I can, and certainly better than some middle management government guy can figure out. So I think quickly what's happened, and I see this all the time now, because people come up to me all the time and they go, Dave, you know, I've had a political evolution very similar. I was, I was a hardcore lefty, but I always thought that I was liberal and decent and tolerant, and now I don't see that over there. And they very quickly, you can make that line from that to libertarian very quickly. Now the difference that maybe some of us might have, and this is why I still consider myself a classical liberal, is I do believe there's some role for government. I believe the role for government is basically what the founders laid out. We have to control borders pretty much and we have to make sure the states aren't warring with each other. But the beautiful system we have here where the states can figure out what's right for them, that's incredible. We have this amazing experiment happening all the time. One state has legalized weed, one state doesn't. Well, if you want legalized weed, move to that state. If you don't want it this way, then don't live there. You know, one state tax is high, one state has better education. What an incredible system to figure out what's right because otherwise, you gotta leave the country if you don't like what's happening. And you just saw this? I saw how it was so couched in the free speech discussion. They do not want people to talk about religion. They don't want you to talk about ideas. This is why they're obsessed with political correctness and word policing and all of these things. And what I realized was that the real issue here is free speech, that you have a duty as an American. You don't have many duties, but I think we have the prime duty to defend our right to free speech. There's a reason that it's the First Amendment and it must be defended. And we have to be able to criticize all ideas. We have to be able to fight for what we believe in. And we have to be able to do that so that we don't start fighting with guns, which is what will happen next. But people on the right also want to shut down free speech. Donald Trump says there should be a law against flag burning. There are no laws being passed that are stopping free speech. And of course, the First Amendment is about the government coming to take away your free speech, not uh, a private citizen or a private company doing it. If they put warnings on some of my stuff. What, what do we do if they just cut us off? Competition is the answer. So I think the best thing that we can do is keep talking about these things. These guys, it's not the first time they can do, they can censor whoever they want. They can do whatever they want. I am very clear about, for all the criticism that I lay on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and the rest of them, they are private companies. They can do whatever they want. I am so convinced that because we believe in the individual and because of the power of that, of believing that the human mind can create great things, we'll be okay one way or another. It may take some sweat and tears and, and all that stuff, but that's all right, let's keep moving forward. The days of cable TV obviously are coming to an end. It's a dinosaur. And this packaged cable thing where it's like, oh, I only care about these three channels, but they're gonna give me 80 other things and I'm gonna subsidize basically 80 channels that nobody's watching. Those days are over. Nobody wants to pay that 120 bucks for all these channels that they don't care about. What I've found is that people truly do want to pay for content that they like. People don't mind paying for Netflix if you really love Orange is the New Black. You don't mind paying for HBO if, although many people just get it from their parents, friends, cousins, nephews, uncles, whatever, the password, but, um, but you don't mind paying for HBO if you like Game of Thrones. And I've found that people don't mind paying for interesting, insightful, original conversations they don't mind throwing in a couple bucks, and in some cases they throw in much more than that. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. You're helping get ideas that you care about out there. What's better than that? The right doesn't believe, generally speaking, that the government is the answer, so there's a lot more room. But you did, you were on the left. You're right. What changed? Everything changed. I realized how identity politics had taken over everything, that we were judging people. That's the fundamental answer, I think, more than anything else. That when I really understood what, what identity politics was, that we're always grouping people in whites, blacks, Asians, it is contrary to the very, the very nature of what America is, this incredible experiment where we have taken all of these people from all over the earth and did this thing called the melting pot and did this multiculturalism better than anyone has done it ever. Nobody's done it better. There's a huge set of people that love to just crap on America all day, but no one has done this better, right? I could look around this room and, and your staff, there's people of all different walks of life here. It's a beautiful thing. And nobody's walking around going, oh, you're from here and you're from here and you're from here and I'm gonna treat you differently. So the only thing there is is the individual and that's what we gotta focus on. Sticking with identity then, how does being a gay man fit in with this? 
I, I am what I am. I mean, that's it. I, I don't want to be judged by that other than I, I happen to be married and you're married to a woman and that's great. And all I think gay people wanted, or all, all I can tell you what I wanted was equality. I don't want extra rights. I wanted the exact same rights and I want to be treated as crappily as everyone else is treated. But when you, when you deny people certain rights, well, then people have something to fight for. But give everyone the same rights and then, then it's on them to figure out how to go be happy. You know, that whole pursuit of happiness thing, it's on you. But if you don't have the same rights, well, then it's a little harder to get to that pursuit of happiness. So life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. All right, I got life, I'm free, but I can't pr pursue happiness truly if I'm not equal. So we should have equal rights for everybody. We shouldn't be rejiggering the outcome for everybody. Yeah, I got identity politics bothered you, but I'm not getting the left to right the moments of aha. There were a couple things that happened in a row. I think the, the moment that people really point to publicly for me is I had Larry Elder, who's a conservative radio host on my show. He happens to be black. And we were talking about systemic racism and I was still in the mindset of a lefty at the time. And I said to him, well, what about systemic racism? Give me the most blatant racist example you can come up with right now. Cops are more willing to shoot if the uh, perpetrator is black What's your data than for, white. What's your basis for saying that? 70% of the homicides are black on black. The idea that a racist white cop uh, and shooting unarmed black people is a peril to black people is BS. And he just beat me with fact over fact over fact about how systemic racism doesn't exist. Not that racism doesn't exist. Again, of course they're a racist and some of them might work in government. Of course that is. You will actually never get rid of it. You, you wanna minimize it, you wanna show people how not to be prejudiced, but you will never eliminate these, these age old things, okay? You can educate, that's, the, that's really the best you can do. Because if you want utopia, you're gonna end up in dystopia. It happens every time, right? So I think Larry Elder sort of beating me about systemic racism really was the moment that I was like, maybe I have thought about these things wrong. And then very quickly I realized all right, as a liberal, I believed in gay marriage because I want people to be treated equally, but a libertarian has actually a better argument for gay marriage, which is that the government should have nothing to do with this. That's actually a better argument to me than I just wanna be nice to people or something like that. The argument is live your life how you want. The only way you can do that is through a limited government. And then once you realize that, then some of these things about taxes and states' rights and all of these things to bring everything back to you as much as possible so you can control your destiny, so that you can live in a place that has the same values that you want. And if you live in a town where the baker won't bake your gay wedding cake, well, that sucks. It does suck without question. But is the answer to give the government power to tell a private person what to do with their business? No, the answer is use your foot vote, leave. And again, I know that's tough. I get a lot of crap for saying that, but that, that really is the answer. If you live in that little town, you gotta get going then. It, it's on you. The answer isn't just hand away your personal responsibility to the government because the government most likely will not fix it. You know, the right wing loves him now because he's a puppet for the right wing. He was lazy when he worked here. He's lazy now with his ridiculous show. These were your friends. Oh yeah, I lost friends. I still lose friends now. I mean, it's incredible because, because this goes to the laziness of the argument of the left. They truly believe, and I don't mean everyone on the left, but I mean what has become the sort of main apparatus of the left. They believe that the, if you disagree with them that you're evil. Dennis Prager has a great line on this, which is that the right believes that the left is wrong and the left believes that the right is evil. That's a huge difference. I, I don't believe the people, even, even these people that I'm very frustrated with right now that, you know, that I used to be part of, I don't believe they're evil. I believe they're misguided. They believe that a lot of people like us are actually evil and they create these boogeymans like the Koch brothers and all of these things and it's like, that, you, you gotta get away from that, you gotta get away from that. But yes, anyone that's watching this that's having their own awakening, you will lose friends. You might lose family members temporarily uh, or, or sometimes in, in perpetuity. But I would rather live and, and stand for what I believe in than just bow forever. And that's what they're asking you to do. They're asking you to bow forever. And what they don't realize is they'll be the ones bowing one day because the thing will keep turning. And eventually there'll be some new thing and they're gonna go, wait, that, that's not good, that's not right. But those hysterical people that they bred because of the ideas that they're using now, they're gonna come for them too. So that's where it will implode. And I guess there's a little silver lining there. But the question is how, how much uh, carnage do they create in the process?